uh, that little colored area there is actually the seabed of the area that I've mapped. But uh, this is just a quick overview of what I'll be telling you about today. So an idea of what was actually planned to be done, what the project's goals were, what and how I did it, and then what were the results of this project and uh, some of the difficulties and future work that we could uh, do if this internship were to be continued. So the project was to make a digital atlas. So it's not just meant to be a map of what's there, but also an interpretation of what has actually occurred and what that means for the geology. So uh, if you've got uh, a fault, for example, it means that there's, there's been some stresses there. Likely it's been stretched, that sort of thing, not just mapping what is just drawing a picture of what's there. So the DMP in WA does actually maintain a atlas of petroleum and mineral fields. But that has very, very simplified geology, and this is a bit more detailed, but more specific. It only covers a small area of WA. And yeah, it's, uh, the aim is to create an understanding of what's happening in the Northern Carnarvon Basin, because it's, it's a very, uh, very economically significant area, uh, but most of the interpretations are uh, proprietary, because obviously a oil company doesn't really want to share uh, all their secrets with everybody. So, a bit of background on the basin. Uh, you can see that there's been a lot of exploration and development within the basin. There's a lot of money to be made there. And as a result, uh, there's a lot of data has been collected. In WA, you have to make your exploration data publicly available after a set number of years, depending on what type of exploration it is. And uh, that means that uh, the DMP does have an awful lot of data. It's uh, maintained in a database online called WAPIMS, and uh, unfortunately they only uh, share the data itself and a select few interpretations. The wide interpretations that I was basically creating and sewing together from other students are not part of the data that they make available for everybody. So uh, using a lot of the uh, mostly seismic data, which is uh, created by letting off a loud noise, it reflects, at different, uh, reflects off different rock layers at different times and then collected. Uh, that's how we map underneath the seabed. So there's, there's heaps and heaps of data available. There's exploration going back to the 1960s within uh, the Northern Carnarvon Basin. So it's obviously too much for one person to handle. Um, so what, what I did was focused on some of the more recent data and also built upon uh, interpretations that other students and staff at Curtin have done. So they may have, they most likely are focused on one particular exploration program. They've done detailed work there. I'll take some of their work uh, from this one, some from another uh, student who's focused over here, and then try and join them up. And that way they've done a lot of the groundwork and they've also uh, interpreted like this surface is definitely this particular rock layer and this one over here. So it means that I'm skipping the early stage of determining which rock layer is which, but also they've already done this patch of the basin. So it's only a 10 week internship and some of these things are PhD projects, some are honours projects, so they've done a lot more detailed work, but I get the head start of they've already done it. Uh, so we selected four horizons, which are essentially rock layers to, to follow, and they were chosen for their significance uh, and also because uh, some of them are easy to pick, which means you can get a nice wide area covered. So the ones that we picked were the seabed. It's easy to find, it's at the top, and it covers the entire area. So that's a good, uh, good starting place, and it also gives a good point of reference for what we've done. So you can see in this image here, oh, uh, where's my mouse? All right, so this, this light blue up here, this is the seabed. Uh, that one's pretty easy. Next one, uh, next surface that we chose was the Mudarong Shale. It's, uh, it's not appearing everywhere. It does sort of pinch out in some areas where it would have been shallow when it was deposited. But it does cover a very wide area. It's found further south in the Southern Carnarvon Basin and all the way down into the Perth Basin. So it is a very large uh, rock unit. And it's also a regional seal, meaning that because it's fine grained, it will trap in any hydrocarbons that are trying to migrate through the rock. So it, it acts almost like a blanket that keeps the hydrocarbons underneath it unless there's a break. And that makes it a very significant rock for the area. It's also, because it's a shale and uh, the 
units overlying it are generally uh, calcareous, as in carbonates. They have quite a big seismic reflectivity difference, which means that you can see that some of these, uh, for example, this red line here, it's quite clear because it's got a big difference between it and the rock layer above it. So again, the Mudarong Shale has that in a lot of areas. The Mudarong Shale in this one is uh, this orange line here with the pink X's along it. And then the upper and lower Barrow Deltas, they are very significant to the, uh, actually to the Barrow Island uh, gas exploration. So while only the upper Barrow Delta, which is this, uh, oh, lost the mouse again, sorry. This, this green layer here, this is the upper Barrow Delta. The lower is not actually marked on this particular seismic cross section. But uh, yeah, they are significant to the structures also found within uh, the Northern Carnarvon Basin and to petroleum exploration. So this was the, the general layout of what needs to be done. So interpret the seismic data, which is, as you saw on the previous screen, that is processed, but not, and in the process of interpreting it, where you add in those colored lines. Then using those lines, you get viewed from the top, you get a large grid of all the different seismic lines, and you interpolate to make that into a surface, because the rock layer is obviously not just a grid. Then with those surfaces, you merge them together, so all the different exploration programs, you essentially sew together these surfaces to make one big surface, and you'll have one surface per rock layer. Then you calculate the speed of sound uh, between each surface, and that lets you, because the seismic data is based on sound reflecting off the rocks, it's, uh, it's not true depth, so you need to work out how fast it's going between each layer in order to work out how to back calculate how deep it actually is. So you create a model using that, apply that model to each of the surfaces, and that, that will affect uh, the shape of the surface. And it can be quite dramatic how much it changes depending on the depth of rock above it and the seismic velocity contrasts that you pass through. And then finally, tweak the colors, the lighting effects to make it so that you can pick out the significant features. And then you can interpret the, the surfaces and see what's going on in, this, in the area. So seismic interpretation. So this is what the processed data looks like. You essentially, you figure out which of these lines is the top of the rock layer that you're looking for. You follow it along and mark it as you go. And you can see that in some places it's a little difficult to follow. If the rock has been broken, you can see that this sort of stepping here is where the rock is fractured and broken into many little segments. But uh, yeah, you can see that there's this, this pink line, which I believe is the Mudarong Shale, and it does continue over there in between. It's not fully determined which, which layer it is, but that's all right. You've got other lines parallel to it and intersecting it, so you end up with the actual pattern of it. Did you do that, or was that done by geologists first? That might be fine. Uh, so... Uh, So these are the lines from the previous one viewed from above. And in this case, the color represents the depth to that line that has been drawn onto the top of the surface. So you can see there's quite a few of them. But luckily, I don't have to interpolate this myself. The uh, Petrel, the software that we use, is capable of finding the mathematical average between these lines and turning it into a nice surface. That can take uh, quite a bit of processing time, but it ends up with something like this. So once you've done that calculation of the speed of sound through the rock layers above each uh, particular data point, uh, you get, so this is the surface on the left that's created from the previous, uh, previous slide. You get a time shape, and then when you change it to depth based on the seismic velocity above each rainbow on it, this one has a uh, perceptually uniform uh, rainbow, which means that there are no bright and uh, darker areas of the, uh, the rainbow. And on the left, the cyan and the yellow tend to really pop. They, they catch your eye much more, whereas on this one on the right, it's, it's uniform. There's no brighter and darker colors. And also, we've uh, applied some lighting effects where 
there's a simulated projected light which creates small shadows. And as a result, you can see that, for example, here there's this, this texture on the, on the surface, which it's certainly present here. It's just very, very subtle. And, and these, these sort of shadows uh, really bring that out and make it much easier to spot. And so the obstacles that we encountered, uh, as expected when interpreting seismic uh, data, there's going to be some difficulty to follow the horizons accurately. It's when, as you saw on that uh, cross section before, when it's all broken up, it can be quite difficult. But that was expected. Unfortunately, the unexpected difficulty was with the Mudarong Shale. Uh, it, it was an exceptionally slow surface to work with and not entirely sure why. So creating the velocity model where I've calculated the speed of sound through the rocks above it, applying it to that surface in order to convert from time to depth, it just, it took, uh, the first stage took uh, a couple of hours and then the second stage was, it just, the time estimated just kept growing and growing. Uh, and as a result, had to call it off. We weren't gonna, <laughs> weren't gonna wait weeks and weeks for one, one of the surfaces when the others completed within hours. And even to display it at high resolution on, on the Hive, it, was, it would take half an hour and then it just wasn't getting anywhere and just not even showing anything. So it's, it's strange, I'm not entirely sure why, because the seabed, which overlies it, had more data points in it. And I would have thought that that would be slower, but eventually what I did was, uh, in order to get around that, I merge the surface again by converting each individual exploration program uh, from time to depth individually and then merging those uh, already depth converted uh, surfaces together instead of trying to do it the other way which was the conventional way of merging everything first and then converting just once and that seemed to work but it was very slow again once I had merged it all together so there's something odd going on with that particular surface but couldn't figure it out. So the results so this is the uh, seabed in the area. Uh, there's a few points of, of real interest. So A, that is what's known as the Exmouth Arch. It's a fold, as in the rock is being compressed and it's, it's folding over like that. It's actually moving up. The uh, orangey yellow color is higher elevation. And yeah, you can see it's folding roughly east-west and uh, point B is the real interesting part about it, is it's a fold, but you can see that these little features here are actually sediment slumping off the side of it, which means that if loose sediment is slumping, that's, it's been deposited in a steady state, but it's, it means that the fold is growing at the moment. So that is a, currently a modern day active fold, but it's also active at the surface. So that means that there's gonna be some compression being applied to the western coast of Australia, but today. And that's, that's a little unusual. And then over at sea, this is the, what's called the Peter Muller Shelf. That's just the edge of the sediment that's coming off Australia into the ocean. And there's a, a shelf front where it drops off into much deeper, uh, deeper water. And you can see there are what looks like little gouges out of the shelf. Those are again slumps, but those are much more expected natural uh, slumps at the front of a shelf. That's just the nature of having a cliff made of sediment. So this is the Mudarong Shale. You can probably see that it's got, it's uh, at B there, it's the same sort of shape that we saw above in the seabed. That's because it's directly beneath it. It's got the Exmouth Arch uh, pronounced there. Can't see any slumps in this one, which means that when this was deposited, this was about 115 million years ago when it was deposited the arch wasn't active and it certainly wasn't causing slumps at that time. You can see that at C, uh, there's, there's sort of two uh, different trending highs, which is the, the Exmouth arch fold actually splitting into two, which you can see on the seabed as well. You can see that it, it does, does split there. And over at A, A is the present day uh, Peter Muller shelf front. And you can see that it's much further forward uh, at the modern day, which means it just, it's been steadily growing at about one, at the rate of one kilometer per million years. So this is the upper Barrow Delta, which is found in the southwest of the, of the area seen above. And you can see that at, 
A, that is what's actually the delta front. So delta being the mouth of a river, as the sediment enters the ocean, it slows down and it just drops whatever's being carried in the river. And so it usually forms as like a, a lobe growing out into the ocean. A is the front of the upper barrow delta. And you can see that again, there's that, that high trending you know, northwest, northeast, southwest. That is the X map arch within this lower unit. And at B, uh, it might be hard to see from a distance, but there's actually these uh, detailed cracks all, all over the, uh, the area there. Uh, that's because there's a 3D seismic program covering that area, which gives us much higher resolution data. And I'm sure that that uh, actually, that texture sort of appears across the whole thing. It's just that where we have the high quality data, you can actually make it out. And those cracks are most likely due to it being a finer sediment. And as it gets compacted, the, the rock itself fractures as the water escapes. You don't really see that in a sandstone because it's got the very coarse grains, which lets the water flow between them easily. But in a finer sediment, it can actually break up the rock. And so this is the lower barrow delta, which is immediately below the upper. And you can see A, that curve there, that is the lower barrow delta front, which is a uh, which has prograded from the south, whereas in the previous slide you can see that it's come from the, uh, from the east. And you can actually see just above the letter B there's that shape which is of the uh, lower barrow delta because this one is much thinner over the top of it and it's just uh, formed a, a thin coating and it's taken the shape of the lower barrow delta. You can also see up here we have the sort of these steps, which are uh, faults. So the faults are actually from the Triassic, which is part of the uh, early stages of uh, extension within the, um, within the Northern Carnarvon Basin, where it's a bit of expansion. The, the basin was stretched a little bit, faulted, and they moved down into this new accommodation space. These faults here, it's not clear if they were actually active when this lower barrow delta was deposited or whether they were just expressed at the surface and it was just depositing on top of them, filling them in. It certainly did fill them in in the end because you don't see those faults clearly in the upper barrow delta. But there's evidence of both uh, them being active and being expressed at the surface, but stationary during, uh, during deposition of this one. And so this is a thickness map of the two. So we have the upper and lower, they're immediately above each other and they cover almost the exact same area. So the thickness of the upper barrow delta is essentially that top surface, subtract the, the bottom one. And you can see on the left, that one is in depth and the one on the right is in time. The reason for it having the, the large area missing is it's so such a small amount of time that it's, it's not really worth displaying. It's uh, almost uh, just noise. So you can see it gets very thin on that sort of triangular wedge. The, the bit at the bottom, bottom left, this is the, the delta front, and it's prograded through. It's a, a 300 to 400 meters thick here, but then over here, it's less than 50. In some places, it's about five to 10 meters thick. That's because it was just, it was this high, there was the lower barrow delta lobe. It's much easier for the sediment to fall down into the deep bit up to the north, where you can see it's, uh, it's actually about 100 to 200 meters thick. And you can see the faults expressed in the thickness because, as you can imagine, if you've got a smooth top surface and a jagged bottom surface, the thickness is going to be overall jagged, which just further goes to show that the faults are only shown in the lower barrow delta. This is the, uh, the same, same surface, same volume, I suppose, just expressed in time rather than in depth. And so it's perhaps not as useful, but you can see that it accentuates certain features such as the, as the faults. So the conclusions we can draw from this. The Exmouth Arch is growing at the moment because of the modern day slumps of uh, loose sediment. It's, it must be younger than the other units. It's like the, uh, the Mudarong Shale doesn't show evidence of slumps. Oh, my apologies. You can see the thickness here. If you'll remember the the Exmouth arch is expressed through these, both of these units, but it's not showing on the thickness, which means that the thickness is uniform across the whole fold, as in when they were deposited, it was just flat, but it has later been folded. 
Otherwise, you would expect to see some sort of, over here, you would expect to see some sort of variation, but it's actually very uniform. So it means that, again, the fold is younger than these two units. So the only unit that, was, that we studied which was actually showing the X-mouth arch being active is the seabed, so it is a very young, young fold. The Peter Muller shelf is prograding at about one kilometer per million years. The upper barrow delta uh, contains fine sediments which cause those uh, water escape textures to appear. The, that would make it a bad reservoir for petroleum as if it's going to crack it when fluids flow through it, it's not going to hold your hydrocarbons. Whereas the lower barrow delta is known as a reservoir already. And then the Triassic fault plots were ex definitely expressed at the surface when the lower barrow delta was deposited, but it's not clear if they were actually active or not. There's, it's, it's hard to tell from the data we have. And so the hive, the reason for using the hive for this one is the, uh, just the sheer scale of these things. You can see this one over here is about as much as I can fit on my uh, screen back in the computer, computer lab. The one on the right is what I can use in the hive. And just good luck spotting those things such as the slumps off the x -Math arch there. So you, sure, you can zoom in, but you can't get a good, uh, a good picture of the, the whole thing that's happening. So in order to see the large scale fold and then the slumps as well, sure, you can see one or the other, but you may not make that connection without having the access to like, a large but high resolution image. And so what can we do in future? Uh, Optimize the Mouderong shale. It was really a problem getting it to, to cooperate with display and with uh, uh, processing, essentially, on the surfaces. It just took far, far too long. If I could find a way to optimize it, that would make it usable. Or, uh, yeah, it's, it, as a result of the slowness in processing, we had to use a simplified velocity model for the Mouderong shale, which it's, it's not as accurate. It certainly took out the seawater to sediment uh, velocity change, which is the biggest change. But it could be more accurate if you were to include every single surface. And you could add in other significant horizons within the area, such as the Mungaroo Formation, which is uh, a bit lower, and the Valanginian Unconformity, which is a time when erosion occurred within the basin. So that could certainly help. And I'd just like to acknowledge the people who've uh, helped with this, this project, made it possible. So I've got Chris Elders and Jane Kaneen, my supervisors. I've got the list of students who've also added in data into this uh, project. Uh, Andrew, Susanna and Josh who've been helping me throughout the using the Hive, getting it working and also with feedback on the presentation. And the colour map used was created by Peter Cavesi. Uh, it's free to use but requires acknowledgement. And yeah, do we have uh, any questions? We've got uh, time for one question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you had a question about the seismic interpretation? Yes, I wondered whether that the um, standard seismic thing you had to identify uh, the layers yourself. Um, uh, so what I did was, so typically what's done is a well is drilled, you identify the rocks there, and then from that you use the well projected onto here to identify which particular reflector. Yes, so they would, they would work out the time uh, to this particular rock that they found, and then with that you can work out the time and it, say it turns out to be this red one at the well, then you can start following it there. Uh, that had already been done by the other, by the other students. That's awkward when the person asked me. <laughs> <laughs> At least it wasn't my phone. <laughs> um, yeah, so thankfully these other students and staff had already identified the reflectors for me and I could just follow off from their work. So that was one of the early stages that they had, they had done for me. So uh, while well, Adam is his... Uh, Hit a plug in. We've probably got one more time. One more question. Yeah. It certainly will. I w in this, for example, in this case, 
this is uh, very, very faulted. Uh, that would lose the fine detail, yes, because essentially the rendering is going to uh, just smooth that. However, you often, you can see these X's. These X's are where you've got a line coming and intersecting this particular uh, 2D line. And so if you've got, for example, here, it's pretty hard, it's probably up here, but it's pretty hard to tell which one you should follow. But over here, you can follow it through and it may be quite smooth on this, uh, on this axis, I suppose. And so this is an incomplete image. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, if I have actually gone along that line and followed it through, but you can do it that way as well. So yes, from what is displayed here, that would just smooth it out and you would get loss of resolution, essentially. But it can be mitigated in other ways. But you don't think that caused performance issues on that uh, No, no, that would actually, it would be less data points and so it would smooth it. James.